the core of Bible Christianity, at its core, is uh, what I'm going to be preaching this morning. Romans chapter 8, verse 22, are you there? Say amen. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Anybody telling you that Christianity should be lived without suffering is not telling you the truth. We are going to groan. The older I get, the more I groan. I'm not kidding you. It just seems like things that never bothered me. Now, they, the older I get, they trip my trigger. And I don't like it. But we groan. We have sufferings. We have travail. We have tribulations. And at times, we have death. Not just the death of ourselves or the death of loved ones. The death of friends, the death of family members, not just that. But things in this world, because they are part of this world, things in this world die. Things don't last. Things are only temporary. And I've learned that in that, God may just have His greatest plan ever in your life by something not lasting, something not enduring, something not sustaining you or giving you joy in life or keeping you happy or keeping you satisfied or whatever it is. Things in this world do not last. They're vanity, they're vexation. And we are appointed unto that. The Bible teaches us that we, as part of God's creatures in His creation, are subject to vanity. And what that means is, we are subject to things that don't last. New car smell does not last. And I don't care how much, that they make a bottle now called new car smell. It doesn't work. When you get in a car, ride it around, foul it all up, that spray just won't cover it. Things are vanity and they're vexation in this life. And what happens is that we get, we get attached to things in this world. And that's the natural, I'm not preaching against that. It is the natural way that we are. We are subject to that. But the things that we get attached to or the people we get attached to or the things that we're counting on, they are vanity. They're part of this world and they will pass away sooner or later. It could be said sooner or later, we're all going to die. And the news is full of, well, don't eat this now because science says that eating this is bad. I've been eating it for years. Uh-oh. Or they say, now, if you do this now, you're more likely to die than those who don't do this. I've learned that with all the advancements in medical science that we have, all the cures that are out there and all the cautions that they give on the news about don't do this and don't eat that, the death rate is still 100%. Doesn't matter where you live. Doesn't matter what country you live in, how good your health care is. Things pass away in this world. Things die. Things don't last. Things that we counted on. Things that we depend on. Things that we think we need. They, they just, they, things die. And when those things die, it hurts. Some more than others. Verse 24, and I want you to look at your Bible. For we are saved by hope. Hope, the definition of hope, hope is not wishing. Hope is not, well, I, I, I hope that it works out better for you. Or I hope that you have good luck. Or I hope this, hope is not wishing. Biblical hope 
is the deep-seated, deep-rooted knowledge that what God said he'll do, he'll do. That's hope. We may have, we've, we have hoped in politicians, and this last week we found out once again that politicians will fail us. We lost a governor after only, what, a year and a half? Our governor's gone. We counted on him. We trusted in him. He failed us. He did things that were wrong. Should have never done them. But he's human. We put our hope and our trust in politicians, they'll fail us. We put our hopes and our trust in maybe legal system, it will fail us. We put our hope and our trust in people, they will fail us. They will hurt us. They will do us wrong. God never fails. So our salvation is based upon hope that what God said he'll do, and in this case, God said that he would give us a home in heaven for all of eternity. He'd wash all our sins away and he would never hold them against us ever again. We're hoping on, I'm counting on that one, amen. So we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. I want you to get that in your mind. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise also the Spirit, or the Spirit, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Underline that passage in your Bible, put arrows next to it. The next time somebody tells you, well, you didn't ask God right. Or you didn't say to God, you didn't say the right words, or you didn't say the faith words. Or if you just had faith, then you would, you would be this way. I, I found out that a lady that I've been conversing with over the years, she'd call every now and then, she'd write emails, she shared some tremendous things with me as far as Bible things are concerned. I, I just found out here, I think that she has passed away. She told me that for years she's had a, a lung problem. And that she could die of it. And she'd been very sick for a long time. And I found out she passed away. She called me one day and she said, Pastor, she said, I'm really troubled. She said, the friends that I have in my Bible study, they're telling me that if I die and because I'm sick, it's my fault that if I had enough faith, then God would cure me of that. I said, don't believe that. Don't listen to that. Did you ask God to heal you? She said, yes. I said, did you, did you, did you ask right? Did you, did you really think and hope that God could heal you? She said, yes. I said that if God doesn't, he's got something better for you. I guarantee you he's got a better plan for you. And she's in heaven right now from what I understand. That's a better plan. So the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, verse 26, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And don't let anybody tell you, well, that you must speak in some unknown tongue in order for God to get that prayer. That is not what that says. If God said they cannot be uttered, then why should you believe that it has to be uttered? Verse 27, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, verse 28, we know that all, in fact, say this with me, verse 28, say it out loud with me. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to His purpose. Do you believe what you just read? What I'm saying to you is, is that when you're looking at something that is either dying or dead, it is hard for us to think this little positive mental thought that all things work together for good. I guess this is good now that somebody's dying or that this is, this is a mess and there's no hope in it or that it looks like I'm, I'm done. It looks like I'm over with. It looks like I'm going to cash it in. There's no reason for me to live anymore. It is hard for us to think well, all things work together for good. Anybody tells you that you've got to be in a good attitude and a good mindset and, and smile all the time, they're lying through their teeth. Because while we know that all things do work together for good, while we're staring death in the face, we don't see it that way right then. Verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
Moreover, well, in fact, look at verse 30 now. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And I want you to notice justified is past tense. He's already done it. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. That also, past tense, he's already done it. But you can't see it. You can't see it. That's not your fault. It's not your fault. That's God's plan. When God is ready to reveal His resurrection to you, you'll see it and you'll rejoice. But until that happens, we weep. And the disciples, when, when, they, when they, Jesus' own mother, watched Jesus die on the cross, their heart sank. They said, all this now that we've put in for the last three years, we believed in Him, we trusted in His kingdom. He's dead. What was it all for? At the core of Bible Christianity, we are the ones who, are, who actually believe that death is not the end. And I'm not just talking about the death of someone that we love or even our own death. Anything that we have put a certain amount of confidence in or trusted in or were depending on, those things can be gone in a moment. And when that happens, we stand wondering, what was it all about to begin with? If this, if all I have to show is the crumpled ruins of my life, what was it all about to begin with? And it can, listen to me, it can cause some people to fall back and say, I trusted God, this is what happened, I'm moving on. How many people in our neighborhoods and in our towns and where we live used to go to church, used to give their life to something related to God, and then it all was destroyed right in front of them, and they just walked away saying, I'll never, I'll never do that again. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Father, help me to preach this morning. I ask your blessings, Lord, upon your word. Lord, would you save somebody's life today? Father, would you save somebody's relationship with you today? Would you rescue someone today who has lost hope? Would you rescue them today in Jesus' name? Amen. Romans 6, verse 1. This is the core of what it is that we believe. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead, notice this, dead. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, uh, let me just ask you a simple question. Do we still believe that we ought to have a Jesus hanging on that cross dead? No. It's a thousand times no. That abomination that they stuck in every room at our hospital over here is an abomination. Jesus is not still dead, still on the cross. He's not being crucified again in the ceremony of the Mass. And that's a, that's a lie out of hell. 
We believe that the Christ who died rose again. That's what we believe. So verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. You know what that means? Get ready in this life to lose everything. Count it all but loss. Bury it. Bury it. Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. Here's, here's the point of my message. This whole Bible is full of death, burial, resurrection. There is not anything, there is not anything that God cannot, even after it's buried, bring it back to life. And when he does, it is better than it ever was before it died and was buried. Newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death... I quit burying people. I quit burying dead people, people who have died out of this church. I quit burying them. I started planting them. Because we plant, we bury, and we think this is it. We go visit their grave, and they're still there. But we plant, we always plant in hope. Always. If we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, watch this now, look at your Bible, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So think about you. Here you are in life, and God had to kill you. Did he not? God had to kill you. God had to kill who you were, what you did, what you believed, what you thought, how you lived, the things you said, thought, did, drank, everything. God had to kill it all. So, the best salvation stories that I hear of are the people that God absolutely destroyed their life. God tore them down like, like the walls of Jericho. God destroyed them. God made them, God made them open shame in front of everybody. Their life was ruined. And God did that so that He could kill off who you used to be. So now He can raise you back and you walk in a new life. And now you are not the same person that you was yesterday. Aren't you glad? When you look back now, aren't you glad that God did that to you? Aren't you glad that God took everything away from you? That God ruined your reputation. He ruined your name. God ruined you. He killed you. So he could raise you back better than you ever were. He that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead. Watch this. Dieth no more. Amen. I'm not dying no more. God does not have to do with me what he did once in my life. He'll never have to do that again to me. Thank you, God. <laughs> I told my testimony, and I'm going to tell it again in this context. I grew up in this church from 1974 on. A.B. Brown, Robert Sherry, Phil Jones, Ken Goff, Lonnie Skiles, Don Robertson, they all preached out of a King James Bible. While I was growing up, A.B. Brown, Robert Sherry, Phil, uh, Phil, what, uh, Phil Jones, and Ken Goff, every one of them preached out of a King James Bible. And I believed it. Then, I went to Bible college. And my faith in this Bible was killed. And I didn't believe it anymore. 
And then, sitting in the rubble of my life, God came to me and said, Mike, this Bible's right in everything that it says. And guess what? This is not ever going to die in me again. You will, never, you will never make enough videos and write enough books to convince me that this Bible is wrong even in one place. I can lose, and I have, I've lost a whole denomination, I've lost friends, I've lost fellow churches, fellow pastors, I, have, I am mocked and scorned and my name drugged through the mud, and I'm called everything online, on the internet, that people can think to call me because I believe the words of this book, and I'm not backing down. Amen. And I, I'm, I'm going to push it on you. I'm going to push it on you. I'm going to make you think that you need to believe this Bible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you verse after verse after verse. My goal is to do six, seven, eight sermons a week, every week, and push this Bible. You know why? Because it saved my life. There was the birth, the death, and the rebirth of this book in my life. And from this point forward, I will never doubt this book again. And here's, I'm not bragging because I didn't do that. I didn't do it. God did. God sent me off. So that he could destroy my belief in this book. So that he could resurrect it in my heart. And from this day forward, I'm always going to believe what God said, even over what I think. That's what I'm talking about. I don't care what died. I don't care what God allowed to be destroyed in your life. Some of you are on the other side of this, and you agree. You say, amen, I've been through that. I know what you're talking about, Pastor Mike. Hallelujah, praise God. That I would Listen, I, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't make it any other way. That's how God did it with me, and I'm walking in, I'm walking in victory every day from here on forward. Some of you are not to the death yet, but you're getting there. Some of you are at the death, and you think it's over with. Let me show you a woman. Let me introduce you to a woman. Turn to 2 Kings. I got a lot of stories out of the Bible to give you this. What, what, I, what I'll turn you loose on when we're done today, 2 Kings chapter 4, I'm going to turn you loose and I want you to just go through your Bible in your mind or just kind of flip through the page of your Bible. And look for stories where there was the, the birth, the death, and the rebirth. You'll see it everywhere. <laughs> Excuse me for doing that, but I'd rather blow it into here than to blow it out on the pulpit or something like that. <laughs> right? There is a woman. You watch, you listen to me now. The church is a woman. Here's a woman, 2 Kings 4. And this woman's heart was right with God. This, listen to me. This woman's heart was right with God. She kept seeing the prophet go by every day. And she said, she told her husband, she said, Honey, get your tools out. That room that we've got in our house that nobody sleeps in, let's put us a bed in there, put us a little table in there, give him a lamp. And from now on, when this prophet goes by, he can stay the night at our house. We'll take care. We'll feed him as long as he wants to stay here. It's called a prophet's room. We have one of those here. And they did that for the man of God. You know what they did? They just put that what that is. It's a picture. The prophet is always a picture of your Bible. And what you have here is you have a woman who is the church who is making room for the word of God to rest and abide in her life. That's good. So here's the story. Look at your Bible. And it fell on a day that he came hither. 
And he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, say now unto her, behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? What is thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, you listen to your Bible. Verily, she hath no child and her husband is old. In my mind, guess who that room was originally for? A baby that she never had. Now she's an old woman. Now he's an old man. We're not going to have a baby. I guess we'll just let God's man reside here. I'll at least kind of feel like a mother to him. You listen to your Bible. Because it's, it's going to shake you. Verse 14, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. Verse 15, And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And you look at what she said. Nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. What breaks my heart is the people who have gone to church and been lied to by preachers. Preachers built up false hopes and false dreams in people. And you know what she's doing? She's protecting herself. She's protecting herself from her own emotions. She's saying, don't say that. I wanted a baby all my life. Don't say that to me. He said, the woman conceived. And bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her according to the time of life. Boy, God's good. Amen. Now look in verse 18. <clears throat> when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him, brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And you can just imagine, there's the old devil going, that's what you get for serving God. That's what you get for doing right. That's what you get for trusting. I've been there. Verse, 20, verse 21, she went up, laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither noon, neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. And then she saddled an ass and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her far off. Then he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with thy child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. The man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? People are far better off not getting their hopes built up again. So she hears the man of God say, you're going to have a baby. Don't say that to me. Don't do that to me. I've had my hopes up for years. And you know how we get. I'm, listen to me. I'm not talking to lost people out here. I'm talking to you guys. You know how we get. We 
Deep down, we'll say amen, we'll look spiritual, but down deep in our heart, we do think that some things are impossible with God. So God gives her a child. And you know how mothers are. That's the joy of her life. And now he's dead. And she went, laid him at the man of God, and she said, I told you. Did I not tell you? I did not ask for this. And I told you not to lie to me. So now, what, what, what kind of God is God? He gives me a son, and I get all my hopes built up, and then he dies? What kind of God is that? I'm preaching about Mike Hoggard. God, why would you, why would you long suffer with me? God, why would you build my hopes up to minister, to do for you, and then take that away from me? I've been there. Verse 29. And then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. If any salute thee, answer him not again and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. But you look at the faith of this woman. She has got to have bitterness in her heart. But she sticks with the man of God. She sticks with the Bible. I'll not leave you. Verse 33. He went in therefore and shut the door upon him, upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. He went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. He called Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. And she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. Better than it ever was. Jesus, in John chapter 11, Jesus deliberately, <laughs> Jesus deliberately let Lazarus die. God will let people die. God will let Things pass away. God will burn a house down every now and then. God will take away everything that you've got. God will destroy a relationship with somebody. God will get you fired. But he has a reason for it. I mean, look, look here. Which part of your Bible is better? The Old Covenant or the New One? New One. This one, all it does is curse us and condemn us to hell. This one gives us eternal life. This has to be done away so that this can come about. What is our country doing right now with the Ten Commandments? God, in this country, for the most part, is dead. His word does not abide in the people of this country. His word doesn't even abide in the churches of this country. And I keep going... God, I, I, want it. I, I, want it. I want our churches back again. I want America back the way it used to be. No! 
God, I want it better than it used to be. Amen? So some things just got to die. Some things you just got to let go of. Some relationships just get destroyed. Some homes just get wrecked. Some reputations just get... People hate your guts. God has to do it that way. He let... Look at verse... Three, therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. He let him die. And you may have said, God, why? Did you do this? Why, God, did you do this? Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord is going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain under the earth. We have stories like Hagar and Ishmael. Hagar, who was simply the slave of Abraham and Sarah. She didn't have a choice in this. Sarah made her go into her husband because Sarah thought, well, maybe that's how we're going to have a baby. So now Hagar is stuck with an illegitimate child and she's cast out into the wilderness and they run out of water and they run out of food and she put her child over against a tree somewhere and walked far enough away to where she could not hear him cry himself to death. And God gave them life again. Naomi and Ruth. Naomi lost, not only did she lose her own husband, but her two sons died as well. And all of that land that her husband had, gone. And she thinks that there's no hope. Because her husband's dead, her two sons are dead. And who's going to have an old woman? And she turns to Ruth, and I can't remember the other girl's name, and says, go, go be with your family. Go, go back to your people. They were Moabites, I think. Go, go. And Ruth said, I'll not leave you. And we know the story that Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, purchased, bought with his own money, the inheritance that, that was in limbo, bought and paid for the rights to raise up a child and when he raised up seed, she, Ruth, gave that baby over to Naomi and said, This now is a restorer of thy life. You got your life back again, Naomi. Matthew 22, God, he said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Mark 12, 27, he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Luke 20, verse 38, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Three times in your Bible he says that. He's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. For all live unto him. By the way, the phrase, living God, 30 times in your Bible. Three. Three is the number for resurrection, by the way. Luke 20, verse 34. Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die anymore. Watch this. Neither can they die anymore. Once God gives it back to you, it's there forever. For they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. 
Now that the, now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, for he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. Romans chapter 4. Turn your Bible there. Romans chapter 4. Verse 17. I don't hear your Bible. Romans 4. There we go. That sounds better. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead. That means he brought them back to life. And calleth those things which be not as though they are. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. His friends, his family may have said, Abraham, your body's dead. You're a hundred years old. Hundred year old men don't have babies. Sarah, your body's dead. You're 90 years old. 90 year old women do not have babies. Abraham said, it's not dead. It's not dead. Because there is still a promise. I did the math. The first time God made a promise to Abraham about his seed, he was 75. He was already getting Social Security and his pension. He was retired. Moved into a retirement village. He'd give it. And, and everybody said, Abraham, you're dead. You're dead. You're dead. Abraham said, I'm not dead. Neither is Sarah. There was still a promise of God giving him and her a baby. And God is not a man that he should lie. So when you go and visit the grave, you can say, they're not dead. They're not dead. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Don't tell me how good you are. Tell me how bad you are. And then tell me how you believe what God said. Philippians 3.8, turn there and then I'm going to turn you loose. Philippians 3.8. What if you lost everything? Can I say something to you right now? You already have. You know what we're supposed to do as Christians? We're supposed to count everything that we've got and put it over in the loss column and say, I've already lost it. Let me ask you a question. What are you taking with you when you die? Nothing. You're going to lose everything you got. I have a life insurance policy on me. And I'd love to have that money. But it cannot, the check can't be written until I die. And then once I die, I won't get it. It's already a loss to me. My house, my vehicle, my computer, my little piano I play, my favorite pants I wear. And yes, I'll wear them every day if I get away with it. My favorite shoes, my favorite chair. Everything I like. I'm supposed to take those and put them in the loss column. I've already been there. When you take and you lose everything that you have in one day, I'm here to tell you when God gives it back to you, He gives it back better than it ever was. Ever. 
So Philippians 3, verse 8, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, be made conformable unto his death. See that? Conformable unto his death. What you love, you'll lose. Let it go. And when God brings it back, He brings it back better than it ever was. This church. When I first sat in that chair, November of 1996... I had been through some of the roughest ordeals and a lot of it related to this church that I've ever been through in my life. And when I sat in that chair, I didn't want it. And people were saying, that church will never amount to anything. People were cursing this church. When God blesses something, He does it better than any that in any time ever. I did a count, Wayne. Every now and then, I I don't often do this. Whenever I put something on the internet. I move on to the next one. And I very, very seldom look back. But I did a count. All the sermon downloads since 2011, seven years, this church has generated, and I say this church, has generated over 10 million downloads in seven years 10 million out of this little bit here just because everybody else says it's dead when God gets involved it's only just now getting started so Verse 12, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Underline that in your Bible. Todd, all that stuff you used to do. Forget it. That's not who you are. Melissa, John, all that stuff, all that nonsense, forget it. It's gone. That's not who you are. Jared, Christina, forget it. That stuff's gone. That's not who you are. And anything else in anybody's life where the devil tried to kill you, tried to destroy you, tried to ruin you, forget it. That is not who you are anymore. Forget the things that are behind. Amen? Amen. Press toward the mark. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Your life is no longer about what used to be. Your life is about what will be. Give the Lord the hand. Now, we're going to have altar call.
Got to on this one. So, come down here to forget. Come down here and bring the rubble, the ruins, the death. Bring it down here. Lay it at the feet of the cross. Walk away from it. And say, God, only you can make it better. But if God makes it, He always makes it better. Come down here, put your life down here. Put what happened down here and leave it. Put bad relationships, bad finances, bad everything. Bring it down here and leave it. And let God raise it back from the dead better than it ever was. Can you do that?